Thank you for allowing me to be back here with you again today. It is definitely an honor. Galatians chapter 5, please. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. Galatians 5. Some other things have changed since I was with you last. And that is called 200 Power Readers. <laughs> That's also what we have. So I need to go to the eye doctor, but I'm not old enough yet. <clears throat> I'm only 48. But this passage has been on my heart, knowing we were coming here, but for the last two weeks, it's really been on our heart, and so I want to speak to you today about a subject and called freedom, simply freedom. But you might think I would start with the first verse, those of you that are familiar with Galatians 5, where it says, stand fast, therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. I'll get back to that, but I want you to look with me, please, in verse number 7 down through verse number 12, just to introduce the passage to you. The Apostle Paul wrote these words to the Galatian church in verse 7, You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? It didn't say what. It said who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth. Verse 8, This persuasion, this is anything that leads us astray or away from the truth. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth a whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. I want you to bow your heads with me as we pray together, and that God will be with our moments that we have over the next little bit, that he'll bless it, that he'll use it, that he'll challenge us, and that he'll speak to our hearts the way that we need it as individuals. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being here. We thank you, Lord, for safety of travel. But Lord, most of all, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word. Lord, to be able to speak of its truth. For God, it is you that we need desperately today. And Father, we ask you to use us over the next several moments together that you would glorify your name. And Lord, that you may challenge us wherever it may be that we are spiritually. And God, speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a moment ago, the orchestra began to play and during the offertory, I believe it was. No, it was during the slideshow and that they played. And the first song they played was one of my favorite. I love that song. And it's, it's just, I love to sing it. America, America, God shed His grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. I love that song. And when I sing America, America, and God shed his grace on thee, those words are so beautiful to me. I never get tired, do you, of singing them. I love this country. I love America. And I've got to tell you, standing up here on this stage with my fellow veterans, what a joy. I steal and have tears comes to my eyes, especially when we were able to honor a World War II veteran. I saw him climbing those stairs, and I thought those are the easiest stairs that he's probably climbed because World War II was no easy task. And that was a very special generation that looked evil in the eye, that fought them eye to eye, from bayonet to bayonet, hand to hand, arm to arm, face to face. That was warfare. Today, a lot of things are technological. And today, things are at the push of a button. We have so much more equipment that helps us in our battles. But that generation was special. And sir, it is an honor to be in service with you today. You are what America represents. I love reading about our history of America. I love reading about how America came to be. 
the Revolutionary War, the events that led up to it. I love those kind of things. When I read it, it reminds me of the grace of God. For God had His hand upon the people that fought for this great nation at the beginning. And God has had His hand on people who were the founders of our country, upon our leaders. And God has blessed America. And He continues to bless America. And so we say we live in the land of the free. Well, I ask you, is that true? I would say yes, it's definitely true and that America is the land of the free, but free from what? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself that question? What are we free from? Freedom was never intended to mean what society has termed it as today. Freedom was never intended to mean that men and women, boys and girls, can do what they want, when they want, however they want, and whatever they feel like doing. It was never meant to, to mean that. Never at all. But society has defined it that way today. You see, contrary to popular belief in making that previous statement, society would tell you that man is basically good with the potential to do evil. But I'm telling you that is not true, for man is basically evil with the intention to do good. So why do I even tell you those things? Because if it is true that freedom were to mean that we could do whatever we want, whenever we want, however we want to do it, and man's basically inclination is to do what is bad, then if we are left unchecked, then what will man do? Man will always choose what is wrong, not what is right. Think for a moment back in the book of Genesis. When the country, when the uh, people were destroyed and by a flood because of the sin of mankind, except those who were saved, Noah and his family, they began to repopulate the earth after the flood. Then we get to Genesis chapter 11. There we read the all familiar story of the Tower of Babel. And there was a generation of people since the flood that were building this great tower, replacing it for a man-made system of religion. They were only 100 years removed from the flood at the time that they began to replace God with an idle form of worship. Some of the members of Noah's own family were still alive during that period of time. And so here you have some who survived the flood or descendants from that family who were now involved in idol worship and much evil. They were being led by a tyrant. So as I think about the definition of freedom from society as the freedom to do whatever, however, whenever we want, it reminds me of man's basic condition is that of evil. Free to do whatever, but we will always choose what is bad. Even when we start out with good intentions left to ourselves, it will end badly even when we don't intend for it to end that way. Because as long as we are leaning on ourselves, we will always go the wrong direction. 27 years in law enforcement has shown me and proven to me this fact is true. One of the greatest colleges I've been to in my life is called Life, where I deal with people day in and day out even those who are professing Christians. And I find that, yes, the flesh is indeed alive. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. So what are we freed from? I asked you that question a while ago. America the free. So what are we freed from? With America in mind, we were freed from acts of tyranny and acts of oppression and from the British, right? The British were unfairly placing a tax upon people, making it hard for people to make a living. That was called taxation without what? You students of history. Representation, right? So they were being taxed, but yet they had not the privilege to be able to voice or to have anything to say about it. So this led to great feelings of resentment and great feelings of bitterness among the colonists who were going against those of Britain. And so this led to 
to circumstances like the Boston Massacre of 1770. And for the next five years, from 1770 to 1775, these feelings of bitterness grew within the hearts of the people. These feelings of resentment grew within the hearts of the people because they were being so oppressed and was under so much opposition and under so much tyranny, they said, we have to be free. So in 1775, in April, it developed into what we know as the Revolutionary War. The Continental Congress determined that King George's rule was to be tyrannical and it was infringing on the colonists' rights as Englishmen, and they declared that the colonists was going to be their own independent states. And on July the 2nd, 1776, because of much bloodshed and much courage, standing against tyranny and opposition, America became a nation. And we stood and we were then free from tyranny, free from oppression, freedom from those kind of actions. Now this battle for freedom did not end at this point because the enemy, British, and kept their hands up on the people of the colonists and still tried to do things that would win ultimately the victory back and from the colonists. But America eventually was a defeated British and we had become our own nation and we were now free. Evil was defeated. Or was it? Because when we think of our history, as we look at America today, we may be free from tyranny of an outside government, but we are not free from, and we do not have true freedom unless we have the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Christ brings us a freedom that no military can bring, no power can bring, no might can bring. It gives us a freedom from sin. He gives us a freedom from guilt. He gives us a freedom from shame. He gives us a freedom from regret even. Friend, know that true freedom is not so much the absence of something as well it is, is the presence of someone. Free Freedom is not the absence of tyranny or of oppression. Freedom is not the will to do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want. That is nothing but insanity and destruction. Freedom, my friend, is the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ living within your heart to give you joy beyond any definition of joy, to give you peace beyond any definition of peace, to give you consolation and comfort and counsel as like no other source can ever give. And that is Jesus Christ. America, though, is rejecting today the teachings of the Bible. America is also rejecting the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are even denying that he is the Son of God, and they would adamantly deny what Jesus said in John 14, when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life no man comes to the Father but by me. My friend, God said it, and that settled it. It is the only way. Jesus is the only way to freedom. He is the only way to peace. He is the only way to joy. This is indeed freedom. Now in America, our technology is certainly increasing. Our education is certainly improving. And our ability to reason is quite impressive. Yet at the same time, our morals are decreasing, our love for our fellow man is degrading, and our love for ourselves is definitely on the rise. So are we free? I think not. We're not free. We are only under the oppression of something else. We don't call it a foreign government, but we need to call it sin. We are under the oppression of the devil. He is manipulating and deceiving hearts, and he is guiding our country on a road away from the Bible, on a road away from God, and we are not experiencing true freedom. America is spiritually in bondage. A country once built upon godly biblical principles has once again become enslaved into the sin and corruption of the deepest sense, and that is in our souls. 
I'm responsible in the state police in West Virginia, and not only to direct our chaplaincy program, which we have five chaplains now, but also of our wellness program. Now, wellness, that's my official title. I am a wellness officer. The ACLU likes that better. But that's what I am. We don't do it because they like it better. I just said that because that's a statement of fact. They like that better. I'm a wellness officer. I'm responsible for the wellness of our employees. So when they in difficulties like alcoholism or any other matters that might come into play, we try to reach out and to help them in any way that we possibly can. And so I teach classes to young policemen in training all across the state of West Virginia as well as others and that the soul of a person is the most essential part of any individual. You have the physical part of a person, you have the emotional part of the person, and you also have the spiritual part of the person. Now, if you're a supervisor at work, let me tell you this. If you're having a problem in the performance of your employee, you need need to know that is a spiritual problem. What, you might say? Really? Absolutely. Because for some reason, that employee has justified in their heart that it's time to lay down and it's okay to do that. For some reason, something has happened to where they've made a coherent decision that it's okay if I don't work as hard as I used to. Now, something could have happened, but that decision comes from within the heart. So you see, when the heart or the soul of a man or of a woman is corrupted, it will control every other aspect of his life. So we then become imprisoned to something that we cannot see, but yet we have have certainly experienced the effects of it. And then it manifests itself. See, evil was once defined as early theologians with the definition of nothing. Evil had the definition of nothing. Well, if you look back in its original language, it actually meant no thing. So evil meant no thing. That means it is not something that is metaphysical that you can grab hold of, that you can touch. But evil is something that presents itself through people. And then you can see the product of evil. So it is no thing, but it does present itself and through people. And so we are seeing evil acts over and over and over in America. This is what the Bible is talking about in Galatians chapter 5. A people once free, once released from this bondage of even sin, once released from their guilt through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, because the Bible is clear, it teaches us that where sin abounds, grace does what? much more abound. So where sin is present, grace is ever present. Where sin is present, grace is ever present. And so we know that it is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and through the grace of God that we are saved, right? For by grace through faith is what the Bible teaches us, so we understand that. So this was a people that was once free through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Understanding His grace was the only means for true, genuine salvation they then returned to the slavery of a legalistic system of do's and don'ts. But this passage teaches us some very special things. So what we find in the verses I read to you in verses 7 through 12 was that the Galatian church was running well at one time, but then the apostle Paul asked them, who did hinder you? You were once, if you are a professing Christian, you were at once at least a person that was completely free. But sometimes people who have been made free, even as Christians, will choose, unfortunately, to go to return to follow a system of do's and don'ts, only placing yourself back into a prison. Think about this. Someone who is incarcerated for a number of years in prison. Then they are released from that incarceration. They have paid their debt into society. Now they are as free as they've ever been in many, many years. Yet when they enter into freedom, they have an ability to make choices. Where will I go today? What will I do today? What will I eat today? Who will I go visit today? 
where could I go to work today? And they have so many choices ahead of them, yet many return into prison. Why? They are more comfortable in confinement than they are in freedom. Sometimes that has been the very case for even those who are professors of salvation, professors of Christ, is that they do better by following a list of do's and don'ts. And so yet we have Christians today who, because you won't allow yourself to be, are not really experiencing the freedom that we could have in Jesus Christ. And then we have others perhaps present today that says, man, I've never heard something like this from a trooper before. Well, this is a good thing. It's a good thing because I'm here to tell you something that a lot of policemen won't tell you. I can tell you how to really be free and how to stay free. And that is true the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the source of freedom. Someone said today, we're really looking forward to hearing you speak again. We really enjoyed you last time. I said, well, you know, the first time that a preacher comes someplace, he always preaches his best message. So it's downhill from there. So I don't know that I can get much better than I was last time, but the message of Christ is superb, and it never grows old. And that is the truth that we've come to share. Because I've seen so many things in life, and I know that Jesus is the answer. It is not jail. It is Jesus Christ. You get Jesus into the heart into the soul of a person, and they can genuinely be free. So what then does Galatians teach us about freedom? It teaches us four things that I want to share with you quickly this morning. Number one, it teaches us that we must hold into the truth. Remember that. We must hold into the truth. And number two, it teaches us that we must obey the truth. We must hold to the truth. We must obey the truth. We must love the truth, and we must walk in the truth. If you will remember those four things and follow me for a few minutes, then I'll present to you some wonderful things about this passage that will help you experience freedom in your life. Because there is perhaps those here today that thinks there is no way that Jesus Christ would save me. There is no way that I could experience true freedom. I've done too much. I've seen too much. I've been too many wrong places. I'm telling you I'm a sinful man. Yes, and God is a loving Savior, a perfect Savior, And he died for your sins, all of them. Every sin you have ever committed or will commit, Jesus has atoned for that sin. And yes, even you today can be absolutely free, but only if we, number one, hold into the truth. Now, verses 1 through 6, and I'm not going to take time to read them all. I just want to point out a few things to you and brief. Number one says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty or the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free. The truth is today, you want the truth? Just tell me the truth. Policemen like to speak it plain. How many policemen do we have here this morning? Even if you're a retired or current police officer, okay, several across the the auditorium. We like it plain, don't we, guys? Just tell me the way it is. Shoot straight with me. I'm an instructor at our academy. I'm one of the supervisors of our new trainees that come through the academy. I'm a little different, though. I go in and have private sessions with them so we can talk about whatever we want. They're all volunteer sessions. And so if they don't want to come, they don't have to. This enables me to talk about Jesus Christ. And so I'll talk to them and say, ask me anything you want. But don't ask me a question that you don't want the answer for. Because if you ask me a question, I'm going to give you a direct answer. It may not be comfortable for you. It may be challenging for you. But I'll always tell you the truth. And the truth is, is that Christ has made us free. And if you will be free, Christ is the only way that you can be free. The only way. So the words used are stand fast. So we have to hold to the truth. Stand fast means that it takes effort to stay in this place of liberty or this place of freedom. Now stand fast was one of Paul's favorite usage of words. Stand fast. 
Stand fast. Because he used it in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. He used it in Philippians 1, 1 Thessalonians 3, 2 Thessalonians 2. Stand fast. Someone who is legally made free in Jesus can still, by their own choosing, live in bondage because they refuse to accept the complete freedom that Jesus Christ has given them. But I, for one, am someone who wants to stand fast in the liberty. I want to stand fast in the freedom that Jesus has given me. I want to have a smile on my face and joy in my heart and peace about my life. And the only way I can have that is to stand fast in the liberty that God has given me. Many once made free through Christ worry about if they're good enough. Have I done enough? Have I done enough good works? To, have I kept enough of the laws to be acceptable to God? Christ fulfilled all of the laws for us. And so the only chance we have of being right with God, having our sins forgiven, becoming one of his children, and going to heaven when we die, is to rest in Jesus Christ. The truth is, there is no other path of freedom. We have to hold to this. Any other way, verse 1, is what? It is a yoke of bondage. He says, do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. America, that's what's happened. We become free from a tyranny and oppression. Once founded upon godly principles have now returned to a yoke of bondage, allowing ourselves to be taken away from the truth of God's word. But we are to hold fast to the truth. The only yoke that we should take upon ourselves is the one that Jesus and talked about in Matthew 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you, Jesus said, and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You want freedom? You want freedom from addiction? You want freedom from pornography? You want freedom from alcohol? You want freedom from bitterness? You want freedom from complaining all the time? You want freedom? Choose Jesus Christ. He is the only source of freedom. And choose Him. Follow and place your faith in him and stand steadfast in the truth that we find in him. The yoke of the world, it's different. The yoke of the world deprives us of the power of Christ. This whole passage deals with those who had to follow the law they thought in order to be saved. If I'm going to be one of God's children, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do something else. And one of those was I have to be circumcised because that was the Old Testament law. But you know what Jesus told them and what Paul addressed to them, actually through inspiration of God? He says in verse number 2, Behold, I say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Do you know what happens when you depend on the world for your freedom? Do you know what happens when you depend on the world for your liberty? Let me tell you, it deprives you of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand that holding to the truth of Jesus, we can live in freedom and joy as Jesus did? Do you recognize you have the power of God that dwells within you? But if you try to rely upon the world for the things of joy and of happiness and of peace, and most, most importantly, salvation, if you try to do that, you are depriving yourself of the power of Christ because the Bible says, Christ shall profit you nothing. And if you try to do one thing to be good enough, you've got to do everything just perfectly. And we cannot do that. Why? Because man is basically evil with the potential to do good. Because the flesh gives us the basic desires to do the things that's wrong. So good luck with that. Give it all you got. Try to do all that you can to obey the speed limit just today. Some of you, you'll never obey it. I say all of you will never obey it, myself included. You have some of you in this church that can't make it to the speed limit. You know who you are. And if you don't, there's a lot of other people in here that know who you are. Because they get behind you all the time. Oh, mercy, they say. I can't believe this. We'll never get to church this morning. I'm behind brother so-and-so. 
for sister so-and-so. You can't even get to the speed limit, and the rest of you can't get down to it. Have you ever tried when the speed limit's 40 to go just 40? <laughs> try it. You'll need counseling. <laughs> just drive. Just drive 25 miles and stay exactly on the speed limit. Not one above, not one under. Right on it. It'll drive you absolutely nuts. You will be certifiable by the time it's over. Yes. You can't do it. That's the way it is with the law. You can't keep it. I don't care how much you try, you will not be able to meet the standard. But Jesus could. He was sinless and perfect in every way. He went all the way to the cross, and there he died. He says, because I'm the only one that can do it, and I'm the only one that will do it, and I'm going to atone for every sin, for every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl, so that all of us could be free. Every one of us could be free. That's what God does. We've got to hold to that truth. That's the only hope of righteousness that we have, verse 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. So we have to hold to the truth and trusting in Jesus, and we have to obey the truth. Verses 7 through 12, that's what I read to you in opening up this sermon this morning. So simply this. By the way, your pastor told me, Jim, we're right on the schedule. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> there is nothing like a pastor in a Baptist church that excites another Baptist preacher more than to hear somebody say, just take your time. What's your hurry? The best training films that I show at the West Virginia State Police Academy are the Andy Griffith Show. <laughs> How many Andy Griffith fans do I have in here? Oh, this is awesome. Wonderful. Wonderful. Do you all remember the episode where Barney went to church? And they had a guest speaker from New York City. Remember him? He got up and he was speaking, and he was speaking ever so calmly, with a very monotone voice, just speaking about relaxing, enjoying life. Just take it easy. What's your hurry? You remember? Barney woke up. For the first time of the sermon, Barney woke up. He never preached anything on sin, but as he was leaving, he looked at the guest speaker and he says, wonderful message today, preacher, wonderful message. Some we can't hear enough about sin. Barney had no clue. But the message was, what's your hurry? Sometimes we get in too big of a hurry trying to satisfy our flesh that we miss the blessings that God has to offer. And I, I have traveled 11 hours to give you this message in 30 minutes? I think not. Huh. There's one thing I'm not known for is speeding. <laughs> so we have to obey the truth in verse 7 because obeying the truth means running the race. We have to run the race. You did run well, he says, but who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Obedience is essential in the race. What in the world are you talking about? Don't you know we're Baptist? Obedience is still essential in the faith. It is still essential in running the race. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but only one receiveth the prize? So run that you may finish it. 
attain. Run that you may attain. You can't run a race competitively without giving it all you've got. You want to give it all you got because you want to win the race. Yet we have professing Christians today that want to get by by the skin of their teeth getting into heaven and don't want to give near of everything they got. They just want to give what they have to. That's bad. That's terrible. And that is not holding to the truth. Obeying the truth is knowing the enemy. In verse 8 and 9, look what he says. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And so he goes with verse 7 when he asks the question, Who is it that has hindered you in this race? What is it that has hindered you? What does hinder mean? Hinder means to cut in. It means to edge in. It means to worm your way into it, to interfere, to obstruct. Y'all ever been in traffic and somebody wants to cut in? And you want to cut them out? (laughs) Hindering is someone that is getting in your way of doing what you want, how you want, and when you want to do it in some respects. In some respects, but here he says in hindering, in this word, in the Greek, it means to cut in, to edge in, to interfere, to obstruct. So the picture is still that on the running track, we're still running in this race for God, but yet someone is coming in and is interfering with your race. They are getting in your way. They are distracting you from where you need to be with God. Now, let me ask you this all-important question. Who is the who in your life that is distracting you from running the race for Christ as you should be running the race? There are things in our history that has distracted America off of the road of godliness into this other world of liberalism. I'm not speaking of any political party. I'm speaking of biblical truth into a way of, that is against the Word of God. Who is it that could hinder your life? Is it a relationship that you have that is hindering you from your race in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it a business partnership that you have that is hindering you from being and running the race as you need to? Is it a position that you hold that is hindering you because of others that are around you that you fear that if you do something one other way, they may be against you then? So are those the people that are hindering you? Whatever it is, these people were no longer obeying the truth. They were now trying to approach God by some other way other than Christ. But yet they're thinking the whole time, God's going to accept them because we've been circumcised, because we've been baptized, because I attend the Volusia County Baptist Church. God's going to accept me because I was there Sunday morning. (laughs) And, And then I was there, I was there the next Sunday morning. You know what it's like? We all struggle in areas of our life. And I'm not attempting to be legalistic in any way, shape, or form. But the fact is that people move away from this race that they need to be running in obedience because they think that God's going to accept them simply because they're doing some particular things right. They feel like God's going to accept them because they tried to keep the law. And they tried to be as good as they could. These people felt that God was going to approve of them because they were faithful to the church, its rituals, its ceremonies, its services, and its rules and its regulations. God's not interested in man-made regulations and rules. God is interested in our soul and our heart and to love Him. And so we have to be obedient. They were no longer running well. But they needed to think about how they had been running. We need to think about how we used to run and how we run today. Are we running as hard today for God as we used to run for God? What is it that has distracted us? What has happened that has cut in on us? What is it that is holding us back? We must hold to obey the truth. We must hold to the truth. We must obey the truth, and we must love the truth. But before I go to the third point, and I know you you was all excited because I had just got to number three, and you know there's four, and you were thinking, whew, finally off of two. 
but there's one thing on two that I need to share with you before moving to three. We need to be obedient to the truth because other people have confidence in us. If you read Galatians 5, Paul looks at them and he says, but I have confidence in you. Then he says, through the Lord. I know that in the Lord, I can have confidence in you because everything is possible in the Lord. When we are being hindered, and we're being hindered in a church, or you're being hindered in, in your leadership uh, position in the church, or, or you're being hindered in any way, shape, or form, know this. Know this. The only way that any issue in life can ever be resolved so that God gets glory is through the Lord. So Paul said, I have confidence in you through the Lord. But there are also people that have confidence in you. And they have confidence in me. And if I am not obedient to the Lord, could I cause them to stumble? Absolutely. Oh, and by the way, that's a sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 deals with that very issue. And the latter part, I believe, is chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians is where Paul told them, if you cause a brother to stumble, you have sinned against Christ. Look it up. Latter chapter, I believe, of chapter 9. If it's not there, look in chapter 8. It won't hurt. You could even go back and read chapter 7 too. Woo! Wouldn't that be exciting? So we have to love the truth as well, okay? We have to love the truth. So we have to stand in the truth. We have to obey the truth. Number three, Baptist. And we're almost done. We have to love the truth. This is probably one of the most important of the three points that I've shared with you, the two thus far, the third now. In verses 13 through 15, For brethren, ye have been called into liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Look in verse 14. Thou shalt love thy neighbor. Look in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. If you go back earlier in the, in the chapter, verse 6, but faith which worketh by love. And so we see this word love over and over and over again. The believer is free to love God and to love his neighbor. Guess what? When you have a relationship with Lord Jesus Christ, guess what? Here it comes. You're free to love your enemy. Woo! Don't want to love them? Oh, somebody's faking it over there. I'm just kidding. We got to love our enemy, but it's the love of Christ that compels us to love our enemies. It's the love of Jesus that helps us to stand. It's the love of Jesus that helps us obey. It's the love of Jesus that propels us forward in life. The believer does not walk in sin, but walks and lives under the greatest of laws, and that is the law of love. Love from and to whom? Love from Christ and love to Christ. He answered the question. He says in Galatians 5, He have been called unto liberty, unto freedom. Who calls us to freedom? Jesus does. Who loves you? Who loves you? Come on, Baptist. Who loves you? There you go. It's all right. You won't be branded Pentecostal just because you shouted out once. It's all right. I'm Baptocostal myself. I have a little mixture. Yeah. I have some Pentecostal friends here this morning. So, we got to love. And we can love, and this love pushes us, right? The law of love. God loves us enough to provide righteousness for us. He loved us enough to die for us. He loved us enough to atone for our sins. Yes. And so the point is this. When we believe all of this about Jesus Christ, we will not use this grace as a license or an occasion for sin. You want to know how to quit your sinning? Fall in love with Jesus Christ. Fall in love with Jesus Christ. It is love over knowledge. I was sharing this with a pastor last night. Love over knowledge. What are we talking about? Well, if you go back in Corinthians where he talks about eating meat offered to idols, he said you can do that. What? 
We can? Yeah. As Christians, you can. Paul said, it's okay. It's not bad because you know that these idols are nothing. You can eat all the meat offered idols that you want. It's not going to make any difference. But there's some other Christians who don't have the knowledge base you have. And they're going to, be, they're going to stumble because of that. So you've got to be careful not to do that. It's your right. You can do it if you want to. It's okay. But you shouldn't because you love your brother more than your knowledge above what's right and wrong. You know what this, sacri- you know what this calls about, talks about? I just told you I misspoke. Sacrifice. Talks about making sacrifices on our account for the good of others because we love people. So love is the key. It pushes us. So let me ask you a question that needs to be asked. If Christ set us free from the law, does this mean that a person can believe in Christ and then go out and live like he wants, doing his own thing? If a person believes in Christ, can he use his liberty as an occasion to go out and satisfy the flesh, knowing that God's going to forgive him? Can a person continue to seek the things of the world and give way to the desires of the lust of his flesh? Can a Christian who believes in Christ, Christ still live in worldliness? Can I answer this for you? Because you don't hear this very often anymore. And I'll try to tell you this in the most intelligent way that I can. No. (laughs) And there's a Greek term for that as well. The Greek term is called baloney. (laughs) No, you can't. You can't do that. The true believer is free from these things. So just think about this for a moment, okay? And see if it doesn't become perfectly clear. If a person is not willing to commit his life to Christ, he does not believe in Christ. Would you believe that? Would you say that? If a person is not willing to commit his life to Christ, he doesn't believe in Christ. But if he believes in Christ, he's willing to commit his life for Christ. That's the only way you can have saving faith. Saving faith only comes by a genuine sorrow, a sorrow over sin because of a genuine faith in God. So if you genuinely believe in Christ, then you commit your life to Christ. He could not believe, not really, unless he, if he doesn't want to commit his life to Christ. For if he really believed, he would, beyond all questions, give all he is and all he has to the Son of God. That's what it really means to follow Jesus. Now, I preached a message not long ago. If I had time, I'd preach it here this morning, but I know I don't. Having a hard enough time getting through this one. <laughs> Called Don't Be a Player. Don't Be a Gamer. God doesn't want players. He wants people that are really sold out for Him. Can I hurry this morning and finish? And the Baptist says, Blessed be the name of the Lord. We must walk in the truth. Now, you might say, walk in the truth. That covers verses 16 through 26. Ain't no way. You're right. I can't cover all of those. But let me just read to you something, if I might, in closing, okay? We must walk in the truth. This is freedom. We hold to it. We obey it. We love it. And we walk in it. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, verse 16. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other. Verse 18. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now he talks about all the things that the spirit, that the flesh rather produces. We know that the flesh itself is not bad, but it's the things that the flesh produce that are bad. For those of us, all of us that are alive today, you alive? Yes, some of you are. All of you that are alive today knows that the Holy Spirit dwells within you, right? If you're one of God's children. Holy Spirit dwells within you. So He's living within His old flesh in that sense. So the flesh itself is not bad, but it's what the flesh produces, and that is bad. So He says, if you will walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then He lists all these things. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. By the way, did y'all still know that sex before marriage was a sin? Did you know that adultery was a sin? Any sexual perversion is a sin. Just thought I'd state that because you don't hear that a whole lot anymore either. Thought I'd throw that out there. Isn't that good? I like preaching with a gun. (laughs) Then verse 22. 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now catch this. But the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. That means that the fruit of the Spirit holds all these characteristics. So if you say, well, I have love, joy, peace, I just don't have much long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. Well, you don't have the fruit. The fruit consists of all those characteristics, all combined in one. And say, so if we walk in the Spirit, we can have all of those things. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. I like that. Those that are Christ have crucified the flesh. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Listen, if you're here today, the best news I can give you is this. Jesus Christ loves you. And if you are here today and you've never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin, know this, first of all, you are a sinner. I am a sinner. For all have sinned and fallen short and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us are sinners. Some of us are saved by the grace of God. Most of us, I would say, are saved by the grace of God. Some of you may be here today and you don't know Jesus Christ. Forget this uniform and everything about it. And just know that I'm a, a man and just like many of you. I'm a person just like all of you. And I was a sinner and I come to know Jesus Christ. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life for Jesus Christ our Lord, right? For He commendeth or demonstrated His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When? Not after you were good. Not after you made yourself right. But while we were yet sinners, He died for us. He died for you today. He loves you. He loves you. He does. And He wants to save you and forgive you of all of your sin. That means you can walk out of here today having placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did for you on Calvary and the fact that He rose again on the third day. You can leave here today knowing this. Everything is good between me and the Lord. I am free. It doesn't matter what I've done. What sins are you talking about? It's an old choir song I used to sing as a kid. What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. From the book of life, they've all been, what, torn out. I don't remember them anymore. What sins? They're not there. You're justified just as if you've never sinned. Freedom only comes by Jesus Christ. Amen. It only comes by Him. America, we've drifted from it. How about you as an individual? Are you drifting away from your race that you were running so well. Who has hindered you? Do you have freedom like you want freedom and like you can have freedom in your life today? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Just before I pray, all throughout this congregation, if you're here today by chance and you don't know Jesus Christ, I cannot save you. But Jesus can will and wants to and desires to. Pastor is in the front. Would love to meet you. Would love to talk with you, share with you. But if you're here today, over to my right, your left, and you would be honest enough to say, Brother Jim, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. Would you just look up at me quickly and look back down? Nobody's going to know. Just by that saying, pray for me. I don't know Jesus. I'm not pointing you out and embarrassing you in any way. God bless you, sir. The second section over my right, your left. Anyone in that section that will look up and say, I don't know Jesus. Just pray for me. Right here in front of me to my right. Anyone at all to look up and say, I don't know Jesus. Just pray for me, Pastor. Pray for me, Jim. Pray for me. The second middle section, just right here in front of me to my left. Anyone at all. I don't know Jesus. All across the building. On over to my left, your right. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. I don't know Jesus. Anybody else? Anyone at all? If I miss you, God bless you, sir. If I miss you, rest assured, Jesus doesn't miss you, anybody. He knows you. I want to have prayer for you. I want you to know today you can have freedom. Christian, if you've been struggling with some things in your life, you can have freedom from that today, but only through these ways that we've shared with you from Galatians 5. Father, we thank you today for your blessings and for your message. And God, for the time that you've given us to share it. God, we just ask you today 
to deal with our hearts. With everyone that's acknowledged this morning, they do not know you. Perhaps they would not have the courage to come down this morning. Maybe even to meet the pastor and say, pray for me. Perhaps, Lord, while in their seat, they might pray to receive you as their Lord and Savior. And God, if there's any right now in the hearing of my voice and of this prayer, Lord, we invite them to pray if they want to receive you as their Savior after me and to say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that you died for me on Calvary. I know that you died to forgive me of my sin, to cover my sin. I believe that you rose again on the third day and are alive today. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Save my soul from hell. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that they would pray that prayer, that they might receive Christ today, that Christians who are struggling might be able to come forward. Just take a moment. Come forward, humble themselves before you and say, God, help me in this problem. Help me in that problem. Help me in the situations in life. Help me, God, to be what you want me to be. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray.